Hello everybody, I'm going to do a video about how to predict the Oscars, specifically original score. Oh, I messed up the parts, just ignore them please. So in case you don't know, um, I really like scores for movies. In fact, here's all the Blu-rays I have that have been nominated for original score. Believe me, that's most of them. Now here are all the films that uh, should have been nominated for Best Original Score. Anyways, I've noticed a couple of trends looking back at some of the winners and nominees of Best Original Score and I thought I should go over some of those trends and uh, explain some of them to you or give my best interpretation of them so you might have an easier time predicting Best Original Score at the Oscars. So, first of all, there are a few p key precursors you need to pay attention to, those being the BAFTA and the Critics' Choice. Now, the Golden Globes usually are among this list, and I think you should still pay attention to them. However, if a Golden Globe nomination doesn't align with any of the other groups, I think mostly ignore it, um, very likely. You should still pay attention to the Golden Globes, use them as a precursor. They'll have a very small show, they'll still post results, very likely. I don't think there won't be an awards from the Golden Globes happening, but obviously they won't be televised, as we all know. Um, but if you're looking for uh, the most accurate predictors, you want to look to the BAFTA, um, which have a 70% accuracy rate in the range of years that I was taking it from, so pretty impressive, uh, pretty far above both the Critics' Choice and the uh, Golden Globes. However, the Golden Globes have gotten one more uh, predictor in pat more than uh, both the Critics' Choice and the BAFTA in the range of years that I was looking at. So maybe look for the Golden Globe winner, especially if it lines up with uh, another place. Um, yeah, those are the major precursors you should look for. I think this is pretty basic Oscar stuff. If you already know this, you can just skip ahead to the next part. Um, but of course, always look at these, always look at um, the predicted nominees. And uh, yeah, let's get to my other, let's go to part two. Part two, um, if a score is on the edge of getting nominated, uh, go for the one that has a better chance of getting best picture. Now, in this past year, we kind of saw this. Um, Terrence Blanchard had got nominated for the Critics' Choice in the Society of Composers and Lyricists. However, he was definitely looking weaker than both Alexander Desplat um, for The Midnight Sky and uh, Ludwig Gordonson for Tenet, so most people are predicting one of those. Um, what probably put Terrence over the line is that Divide Bloods was actually doing a little, uh, definitely more Oscar campaigning than Tenet, which literally had zero Oscar campaign and also probably The Midnight Sky, which had some, and was clearly put out by Netflix, but Defy Bloods was more of a picture contender to those two, and that's probably how it ended up getting in. In 2017, Three Billboards Outside of Missouri only had a Golden Globe nomination, making it weaker than the both The Post and Blade Runner, which got two nominations each from different precursors. However, what probably put Three Billboards over the line is the fact that it was a bigger uh, contender for picture, uh, definitely than Blade Runner and also The Post. The Post barely squeaked in, only getting a Best Actress nomination alongside its Picture nomination. And Blade Runner, while getting a bunch of Tech nominations, didn't get nominated for Best Picture at all. Three Billboards at this point had won two major Best Picture awards, so it probably would have been good to go with Three Billboards for that reason. There's a couple other examples where Michael Clayton, in The Hurt Locker specifically, Hurt Locker was obviously... Uh, front runner for most of its run and ended up winning picture and was also nominated even after getting no nominations um, These are very hard to predict. I'm not gonna lie But maybe if you're seeing a tie you might sometimes want to go You could risk it and go with uh, a picture contender that has a somewhat prominent score um, That could compete in this category In 2014, uh, Thomas Newman was nominated for the Bridge of Spies movie over The Danish Girl and Steve Jobs, likely because of its picture prominence and both its composer. Um, yeah, it being Thomas Newman, who is a giant in an industry. <clears throat> there are also, also a couple of other examples that you might want to look up on your own. Uh, we got The Imitation Game, 127 Hours and Moonlight and Marriage Story. Those are a little more minor examples, but they're still relevant examples. <music> uh, 
similar to my first part is if you don't have a clear winner, go with what has a better chance of winning picture. Um, this is a little less relevant. It hasn't often the winner is pretty clear. Often something will win two or all the precursors or many, most of the majority of precursors and easily be seen as the favorite. However, there are a couple of years where it wasn't as clear, so you could easily, um, Black Panther is a big one. Black Panther was kind of going up against If Beale Street Could Talk and Mary Poppins. However, um, it was a much bigger picture contender, as in it was nominated for picture, um, while Mary Poppins and If Beale Street Could Talk were not um, giving it the easy win, while First Man, who won the other two precursors, uh, was eliminated along with Star is Born, which won the BAFTA award. Uh, was also not eligible for this award, uh, giving Black Panther a clear uh, run to the win. <clears throat> in 2014, despite only having the BAFTA win, uh, Alexander Desplat took it home for uh, the Grand Budapest Hotel, mainly due to um, the Grand Budapest Hotel being a pretty big player. It won the Golden Globe for Musical Comedy. It was nominated everywhere for Best Picture, um, so that made it a pretty important award to win, and it makes sense why it beat out things like Interstellar and The Theory of Everything. Uh, Theory of Everything won Critics' Choice, but neither were as big as... Um, <clears throat> neither were as big as the Grand Budapest Hotel. <clears throat> In 2012, there wasn't a very clear frontrunner again, but uh, Life of Pi ended up taking home with just a Golden Globe versus its competition in Lincoln, which won the Critics' Choice, and um, Skyfall, which ended up winning the BAFTA. Uh, Skyfall only was nominated and won at BAFTA, so that was a little bit easier to see, but also um, there was clear competition from Lincoln, seeing as it was also a big picture contender, but the fact that um, Life of Pi ended up being a frontrunner for director um, made it uh, Life of Pi's winning easier. Part three, you want to look out for disqualifications and uh, song-heavy uh, scores. La La Land is the exception to this. Let me get that out of the way. It swept the award season and was eligible because there um, it was all original music um, and there weren't too many songs. Um, that's opposed to things like A Star Is Born, which it wasn't counted, I believe, as an original score. It was only one. It only won the BAFTAs. Mom Mia was nominated the BAFTAs again. That wasn't eligible or it wasn't nominated mainly because of how song heavy it is um, and it's not a big again picture contender is somewhat factors into that as well <clears throat> but there have been very prominent original scores which include old music and therefore make them uneligible uh, you saw some of them in my blu-ray collection arrival uh, birdman the revenant all had some non uh, non original music and also there will be blood all had some music that had already been made um, in, in the case of there will be blood Johnny Greenwood had already made music they decided to add into his score but wasn't eligible because he used old music and it wasn't created just for the movie therefore it couldn't count um, yeah look out for those and also look out for anything that's song heavy don't predict a star is born just because it wins the BAFTA uh, same for something like a love on rose <laughs> fourth part is going to be talking about the Society of Composers and Lyricists um, and how you should start paying attention to them because they've become, in my eyes, a pretty reliable precursor over their only two years of existence. They're kind of becoming the new guild of sorts for composers, um, for media in general, and a lot of that obviously encompasses movies. Uh, they did pretty well this past year in the nominees getting uh, out of their five nominees, getting four, and also putting Minari, which was the only one they didn't have in their main category, put, put in independent, um, which is you know very commendable that they managed to get them all and uh, just put Minari in independent. It would likely might have been in feature um, if it was considered a big studio film, which obviously it wasn't. Um, and they did very well with that. They also predicted Soul correctly, uh, along with every other precursor, which doesn't make it as notable. Same with Joker, though. Last the year before that, they uh, correctly awarded Joker uh, the Oscar did as well. While most other precursors did that as well. Um, the nominees they had that year weren't as accurate, but the fact that they were so accurate this past year makes me think that they're starting to become a pretty good predictor of this 
Award, and that you should definitely be looking out for their nominees and count them along things like the Critics' Choice, the Golden Globes, probably maybe more than Golden Globes now, and definitely the BAFTA. So uh, definitely look out for the Society of Composers and Lyricists. They do their awards pretty early, so you can add those to your Oscar uh, tabulations uh, pretty early in the season. <laughs> Somewhat similar to my idea that you want to go with a best picture um, contender if you know you're on the if it's between two things you want to go with a better picture contender. Um, you kind of want to look for films that are also being campaigned decently much because a film that isn't campaigned at all, uh, notably like Tenet, uh, likely won't get anything in this category, especially um, especially if it's not as prominent as some of the other um, films that's competing against. Uh, in 2019, First Man was snubbed despite uh, b winning two precursors and being nominated everywhere. Some of this can be con contributed to the fact that Universal was clearly focusing on their campaign for Green Book, which would go on to win Best Picture. That could also be seen in many uh, snubs that First Man received um, at the Oscars. Many nominations that it was expected to get did not end up coming into fruition. Uh, for them. You could also see this in examples like two thousand twelve where Sony had both Moneyball and the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, but clearly Moneyball was the bigger competitor for Best Picture, so there was probably a lot more focus put onto that movie for things like screenplay, actor, and obviously best picture. Um, leaving the girl with dragon tattoo, which was definitely a less of an Oscar movie behind in a couple categories including original score while Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross were nominated both the Golden Globes and the Critics Choice and I think even the BAFTA uh, They ended up getting snubbed mainly I think somewhat because Moneyball was just much more of priority for Sony and that the girl with dragon tattoo score need to be campaigned um, and promoted in order to get nominated and uh, unlike some of his other parts like editing which ended up winning but um, you can see that specifically in this case. In 2010, you had The Informant, which also got a couple nominations at Precursors. However, um, it being from Warner Brothers, it was behind a couple of properties. Movies like The Hurt Locker obviously had priority from its studio. Fantastic Mr. Fox was a pretty big thing for Searchlight, especially an animated feature. And Sherlock Holmes uh, had more prominence, specifically from Warner Brothers. Um, the informant was behind films like Sherlock Holmes as far as prioritizing, it feels, uh, for Oscars. Alongside things like The Blind Side, which obviously got picture and acting. As well as Harry Potter was looking at some of the tech categories that year. So you definitely got to see... If the movie, even if a, mo a score seems exceptional to people and they get nominated, if they have zero Oscar relevance, as in the studio has it pretty far behind in their Oscar campaign, or maybe even one behind, as in they have a really big thing like Green Book uh, or something you think is a picture contender, you might want to hold back. My last point is that honestly, you just want to look out for big names. Uh, people like Alexander Despot, John Williams, uh, Thomas Newman, and a couple other people who are starting to up and coming. You definitely want to look at them almost every time, um, especially, and also Hans Zimmer, of course. Um, John Williams obviously is a titan in, in this category, uh, getting three nominations for Star Wars alone, but of course having 52 nominations or 20, how many? <clears throat> John Williams has 54 nominations over the course of his career. Uh, some of them are for, obviously, a lot of sequels. Uh, those will no longer be eligible, so do note if he's doing like something like Indiana Jones 5. If he doesn't have enough original music, it will likely be uh, disqualified. But since that rule hasn't changed in, until recently, uh, he's been able to get nominated for things like Rise of Skywalker, The Last Jedi, um, and The Force Awakens, even though I think that has enough original music to count. But obviously, he's been nominated for a lot of Indiana Jones films. And just every, and anything that Steven Spielberg works on, uh, unless it's not an original musical like uh, like it's a, like West Side Story or a couple other things. But also look out for Thomas Newman. He has uh, twelve nominations. Alexander Desplat uh, is also pretty prominent. He has eleven nominations and two wins. 
especially uh, he's been very prominent this past decade, racking up eight nominations in the past decade. Thomas Newman even has 14 nominations, however he still hasn't gotten a win, but I'm sure the Academy of the Music branch will still be looking forward to nominating him and trying to get him that win if he gets a movie that's prominent enough and a score that's prominent enough. Uh, look out for some of these up and coming composers. Trent Reznor and Agnes Ross have just grabbed their second Oscar. They might be more of a thing easy to nominate uh, depending on what work they do, especially if uh, the work they do is an Oscar movie. Definitely look out for that. Um, Mika Levy has been doing great scores. Uh, she's doing a more Oscar movie. Uh, look out for her, and as well as Johnny Greenwood and Nicholas Patel. Uh, they've been doing a lot of work as of recently. Uh, they're both involved with a couple projects that might be uh, looking for Oscars, so definitely look out for those. Um, also look for uh, Hilder G. I can't say the rest of her name. Not trying to botch it. She won recently for Joker. She's doing looks to do the new Cadbury Glass movie, uh, which looked to be a pretty big Oscar contender. So look out for people like that, especially if they're up and coming uh, people like that. And uh, yeah, that's kind of all I have for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, yeah, this has been my guide on how to break the Oscars for original score edition. Tell me which one I should do next. See you.